telescope, extracting the signal from the noise. It's the Cube, covering VMworld 2015. Brought to you by VMworld and its ecosystem sponsors. Now your host, Stu Miniman and Brian Gracely. Welcome back to SiliconANGLE TV's live coverage of VMworld 2015. I'm Stu Miniman and my co-host for this segment is Brian Gracely and we've been digging into the networking discussion. Uh, excited to have uh, you know, somebody that's both a customer and a partner, been working with uh, VMware on the networking side, actually been working with Nasira before uh, that either. So it, it is Chris Drake who is the CEO of what is now called Armor uh, until yesterday was known as Firehost. Chris, thank you for joining us and uh, can you tell us a little bit about kind of your background and about Armor? Absolutely. Well, first off, I'm a military background, third generation paratrooper. I used to jump out of the airplanes for the 82nd Airborne Division, and a lot of security people kind of start from the military in their in their earlier days. And uh, I started building some of the world's first websites for the world's largest organizations. I quickly learned that this security problem was happening on the application layer, and uh, realized that it was growing immensely fast. And so I seeked out to build the world's most secure cloud, and we did that, which was the company name was Firehost. And then over time, a lot of organizations kept asking us, can you secure my cloud or my enterprise IT environment? And so uh, we did, we launched a product uh, called Armor, and we fell in love with the name so much that uh, we actually rebranded our company as Armor. All right, so my understanding now, you're, you're helping to secure other clouds, are you still doing your own cloud? Absolutely, so when, when, uh, when uh, organizations has a workload that's solving for the most paranoid of data, whether it's uh, payments information, healthcare information, intellectual IP, uh, things like that, uh, then we have the proper environment for them, all sitting on VMware, all leveraging the NSX stack, uh, global 1,400 customers in 42 countries. And, uh, but yes, we can extend our security into their enterprise IT environment, vCloud Air, and, and other locations. So the, the, the most secure you know, cloud in the world is a pretty bold statement. It puts a big you know, target, you know, bullseye on you guys. Why do you need network virtualization? Security, you know, historically has been very uh, demarcation point, separation of resources. What does virtualiza network virtualization do to, to drive that security? So uh, there's, there's a thing called uh, humans that uh, create some complications in the network stack, right? So when you have a cloud environment, uh, they have DevOps and uh, sysadmins have real-time control over the network interfaces and all sorts of activities. And so you have to be able to secure uh, at scale and, and be agile to the business. And so that's where uh, software-defined networking, NSX, makes sense for us because we can manage those security policies uh, in a dynamic environment. We have 1,400 customers. We manage you know, almost 10,000 virtual machines and every one of them is a snowflake, right? Every one of them has different security policies that have to be around every VM and, uh, and we need to manage that at scale. And uh, so that's, that, that's our approach to market, is to you know, not have these generic security policies where you have DMZs, and you know, that's 2005 networking topologies, right? But every single virtual machine has, a, has their own fingerprint on what the security posture should be. Yeah, you yeah, made a great point, Chris. I mean, uh, you know, being in the network space, I remember even the best s security tools out there, if there's incompetence or malevolence out there, uh, you know, the people can, can kind of screw it up. C can you give us, you, you know, what's your take on just security in the cloud? You know, we've often said that, I mean, security is given as, you know, often the number one inhibitor to people thinking about cloud or using cloud. So, uh, well, there's, there's some problems in the security space from a vendor perspective because the security vendors, if you know the space, uh, which you do, has all been solving security to the enterprise, right? So they have not been friendly with multi-tenancy. And so, uh, so, yes, they have great rules engines and processing that can, that can take a couple IP addresses and, and have line rate speed inspection. But when you have 1,500 customers, like I said, we're all snowflakes in the back end, all independent, those rules break down. The processing can't happen fast enough. And so, uh, so that's where the breakdown is on cloud, uh, is the multi-tenancy aspect. Secondly, people are, are having, they're not having security conversations right now. We are going to have security conversations soon. They are having compliance conversations. And, uh, and I absolutely uh, can't stand compliance. I, this is my little soapbox that, you know, if you look at all the breaches over the last uh, 12, 24 months, over half of them were PCI compliant or, or HIPAA compliant or just certified for compliance. And so the, the problem with uh, compliance is that it's an annual audit. That's you know the, just like an accounting organization goes through a financial audit. You're doing security audits annually, and then you have DevOps the next day that does something, opens the environment up, and either you find out in 12 more months when the auditor comes back, or you find out when a hacker breaches you. 
right? So uh, the problem with security in the cloud is we're not having that conversation right now of true security. We're having a compliant conversation, which uh, uh, is not, does not equal security. Yeah. Now, you, you just threw out the word DevOps. DevOps is about agility, about moving fast, about continuous integration. How do you justify that? How do you rationalize that with the security posture, which you know, traditionally tends to be don't make as many changes, don't do, but what does DevOps plus security mean for you guys? So uh, the, DevOps plus security means you must state what is a known good environment, right? And then you need to manage drift from that environment. The things that DevOps do that modifies the cloud infrastructure are things that they may need to do, right? But the problem is, is that there's no visibility uh, and to the, the changes that they make, whether those are okay changes and it doesn't create more risk in my enterprise, or those are horrible changes, and as a CISO, I won't find out until my auditor comes back or until I get breached. And so it's really about managing the configurations, knowing what's good, and then managing drift from there. And how does NSX help you with that? Uh, it's, well, it's first off, is we can have flexible configurations. We, we were, before NSX, we were having to lock down configurations where the DevOps had no control. Right? And, and they would have to provide uh, rationale and you know, they need this port open or this service you know, exposed or whatnot. And we would have to go through an audit process and a validation process, making it not agile. And until, until NSX where we're able to expose controls to DevOps and also expose the configurations to our own uh, virtual CISO, if you will, we have a platform that manages policies, uh, you know, we were not able to provide them agile tools. So it's not until our NSX environment that we're actually able to expose functionality to the DevOps to make security not so inconvenient. So Chris, uh, I'm curious, uh, your solutions, do you have to use a vSphere uh, as that? You know, because NSX does support more than just vSphere. What, what's your experience in, in the hypervisor? How important is that as it ties into the NSX? Piece? So we, we are 100% VMware based on the, on the vSphere side. And the importance for us as a secure uh, per, a security provider is that we don't have to worry about it, right? Uh, is that it's it's a it's a very solid foundation, uh, and and I can focus on having our organization think about security rather than the plumbing, which is the virtualization layer. Also, when I go into large enterprises and they ask, you know, what's your you know network stack or your topology looks like across your virtualization layer, when I say the word VMware, I can get a, I can get through that conversation easily. If I say other words that uh, open source technologies or whatnot, then I'm having to defend why open source is secure and those kind of things. Okay, so when when you're selling your product into other clouds, though, do, do you find the same thing, or you know, are, what, so what's your experience? So the uh, the thing that I'm seeing when I go into other clouds, well, our security only sits inside the virtual machine and other clouds at the moment. So we're only securing the operating system and the underlying things like anti-malware, FIM, logging, all those kinds of activities. The things that, uh, that I'm excited to hear about in the near future from VMware is how NSX can go across the other clouds, because what's bothering organizations is the IP space isn't consistent. Is that, you know, when you think about multi-cloud strategy right now, the clouds are their own IP space, and so they can't truly move assets from one cloud to the other, because IPs are a pain to change. I don't know if you all know how that works, but you know, changing DNS record, BGP, things like that, uh, creates downtime. Been a lot of high profile uh, credit card driven hacks, you know, retail, some other stuff on the web. Um, a lot of customers want to know when, they, when they're using an external cloud provider, how do I manage that relationship in terms of things like uh, repudiation, in terms of you know, who should be responsible for that? Like, how do you guys think about this sort of shared responsibility of security and, and what's evolving in the cloud space for you know, who, should, who should maybe pave liabilities and stuff like that? Oh, absolutely. That's, that's a question we get all the time is identification, right? What is, what is uh, you know, the SLA and the responsibility that if I get breached? Uh, well, first off, it is a shared responsibility. Uh, Armor takes on more responsibility than anybody in the space. So if you were to look at the, you know, all the security requirements for PCI or whatnot, we have 85% you know, coverage uh, for those controls and the 15% the customer has to worry about because we can't simply do it for them. Uh, and then and the, the second one is it's all around the metrics in which you provide the customers. Uh, we actually tell the customers what our security KPIs are. And, so, and a lot of people don't think about a security KPI Right? So we think about uh, security KPIs as we guarantee our customers that one of our KPIs is for every two million true positive attacks that come to our network, we get one infection. For every one infection into our network, we average dwell time of one day. Right? So that, that's, and the, by the way, the industry average on dwell time, which is, dwell time is the time of that a hacker, once they infect a machine, until when uh, that infection is t uh, taken off and that machine is considered clean. The industry average is 205 days. 
Wow. Right? And so we are averaging around one day. So we actually deliver KPIs to a customer, and we'll wrap an SLA around it, as well as we also provide cyber insurance. So we are the only uh, secure cloud that's backed by AIG. So every customer that comes into our environment immediately get $100,000 worth of cyber insurance because we know we're a safe driver, right? If you think about the car insurance model, you know, we're a very safe driver. And, uh, and so AIG can underwrite us on a cyber insurance policy. At the end of the day, this world is going to become an insurance game. You know, you have big organizations spending half a billion dollars a year in cyber security, and they're still getting breached. They spend half a billion dollars a year in, in compliance, they still get breached. What do they do? They eventually have to kind of say, we gotta buy insurance for it. It's gonna happen no matter how much I spend. Right, and so, and, and, and you can't be, uh, you can't have great insurance rates until you're determined to be a safe environment. And that, that's what we are. Right. So Chris, uh, you, you've been speaking at VMworld. Uh, I'm, I'm curious what kind of questions you're getting from your peers out there. Uh, what maybe misperceptions uh, you're clearing up about NSX or uh, some of the key things that, that you're helping to deliver. So a couple of things that we've been, uh, one of the, 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 one of the topics that I discussed uh, this week at VMworld was the idea that give up protecting the endpoints, right? That is a unwinnable battle. You know, if we talk about endpoint security, you know, I, I, I'll just leave the room. And the reason why is that you have to assume your endpoints are compromised. Also, you have to assume that your network's contested. You have to assume that all your partners and all the integration points that connect into your environment, uh, whatever they told you about their security is not true, right? So first off, have that base assumption and then we can have a good security conversation. And then what we've been talking about is have a data-focused model. Uh, and the reason why I say that is, what is the data? Don't care about the app, right? I can give you a story about a, an app that was hacked that no one would think would be high security and it wound up being high, high security requirement. Is focus on the most sensitive data in your, in your enterprise. Whether it's the payments, whether it's healthcare, what's intellectual IP and things like that, and secure that. And when you get the KPIs around the things that I described about dwell time and, and the attack to infection ratio, where you feel comfortable as a business, then you can move across the, across the enterprise. The thing that, I, that I really preach is that if you're focused on the entire landscape, you'll be, you'll be ineffective and nauseated. This is where people that are spending half a billion dollars and still losing the battle because they're focused on the endpoints, they're focused on BYOD, they're focused on the network, their corp IT, screw that. Focus on the endpoints on the data, where the, where the valuable data lives, and you'll have a successful security operation. Now, and, and NSX, uh, this is what's great about the NSX environment, is that you can create snowflake-like postures, right? So you can say, instead of having you know, a non-secure zone and a secure zone within a traditional networking architecture is that you can focus security postures around every single virtual machine. Because you may have three web servers in a web farm, but, but one web server has to run a process at night that has to open up SFTP, for example, and send out something, right? And you put those web servers in the same posture, and now your entire web farm is the same posture of your lowest common security factor, which is SFTP. So we're trying to have you know, data-centric models and a snowflake policy management, which NSX you know, kind of enables. You've been obviously working with NSX for a while. You talked about having worked with NYSERA prior to the acquisition. Mm -hmm. As you talk to your peers, what can they expect in terms of a transition? I mean, Stu and I both have a lot of networking background. We've been through some of those things. The, the technology is one piece, the people and process. And what's, what, did you, what kind of changes did you guys have to go through to, to make you know, virtualized networking, virtualized security part of what you do? So the biggest change we had to do, well, it was a positive change, was pre-NSX we were very manual. Like we said, anytime, anytime a, uh, a, a certain firewall or a certain sort of network topology adjustment had to happen in real time, we had to go to engineers and have that to be executed. And the change that we have was exposing the NSX's platform and the capabilities to the customer. And so we worked really hard to integrate with their API set and make it very intuitive to, for them to add IP groups, service groups, firewall rules, and, and things like that. And uh, another thing that we are enabled to do now is expose those policies into the customer in real time and then map it across a, a compliance framework or a security framework to say, these are the things that are exposed. When the auditor last came in to validate your security requirements or your compliance requirements, how has Drift changed? And we can do that in real time now rather than doing it you know, every year. Yeah, so Chris, you know, my, my friends in the security industry say one, one of the biggest challenges we have is that, you know, when I deploy something, 
you know, I need to keep it up to date. And networking traditionally has been something, you know, let's put it in there, let's get it all done, and then let don't breathe on it. Right. I mean, especially, you know, Cisco specifically, mm -hmm. it's, you know, firmware upgrades, no, I don't want to do that. So, you know, c can you kind of, you know, round, the, round that for us, and, you know, how do we think about upgrades and, you know, moving things forward uh, to keep them secure? That's another KPI that uh, we manage, and the industry calls it points of risk per device. Mm -hmm. Right, so from a security perspective, uh, there are you know, a, a international financial institution um, that spends half a billion dollars a, a year, uh, uh, drives for a, what is called a point of risk per device of less than 10, they said around nine. And what a point of risk per device is, is for every device connected to the network, how many vulnerabilities exist in that device? Could be firmware, could be patch level, all those kind of, it could be uh, firewall rules, all those kinds of things. And, uh, and, but the problem with uh, points of risk per device is you have to have a great patch and vulnerability management process because if you don't, you get downtime. It is the, ex you know, because if, if Super Patch Tuesday comes out or whatever, right, and you hit apply to everything, things break. So to get to a very low points of risk per device and have great uptime is a constant struggle. And Armor, we have two, uh, points of risk per device. Our average over the last six months has been two. You know, and, and uh, the best in class has been about nine or 10. So realistically, when can we expect to see the Armor set of services deployed as a, a functionality in vCloud Air and, and into this sort of one cloud uh, message that Pat's talking about? Well, I have a breakfast with Bill Fathers tomorrow morning, so uh, <laughs> we'll work on that. But, uh, you know, but it, it's, it's deployable now, uh, to be honest. The, the difference between what's available now, because we built this product called Armor Anywhere. So you take Armor and bring us anywhere, right? Yeah, real, real creative name. And, uh, uh, and so, but that's, a, that's deployable at any environment across the world. The difference between the vCloud Air relationship that we want to have and that we're working to, to, to execute on is the marketplace integration. Right, is that let's embed ourselves in the marketplace so when you go into vCloud Air's marketplace, you simply add a, add a VM that already has us in there or VMs that already exist, you add us in there and you get billed through your same billing model that you would. And, and so the technology pl platform tying into our security team is all there, it's just how efficient is it in the marketplace. Excellent. So, so Chris, you, you work pretty closely with, with the NSX team. Yeah. Uh, Where's the white space? What are you asking for going forward? You know, where, where do you see this this whole space maturing going forward? So, uh, so the, the white space is actually uh, they're they're working towards solving that, but they're uh, uh, it's actually based off of real time reporting and, and on and on the fly decision making. Because what we are seeing is the world's not turning toward the world's moving away from signatures. So, you know, all the all the security that's been written in the past is all signature based, and we're now going towards algorithms. We're looking for behavior. Right? And so we've got to look for behavior in real time. Because when, if, if the hacker is able to access information for even a microsecond, it's too late. Right? Uh, I don't know if you know how memory scraping works and things like that. So they're, they are not even relying on uh, data actually getting to spindles or getting to SSD. They're catching things in flight in memory. Right? And so uh, the white space is to provide people like us that have the, uh, the security professionals and the algorithms to actually see what's happening in real time and make decisions and block things in real time. So the first request, we, we see what's going on. The second request, we deny. And, and that's, that's where we see the space, because it's, it's moving that fast. And, we're, and what's amazing is you know, that's where our focus is, is trying to get things in the second packet. You know, and the industry is trying to get things in 205 days. So uh, the, the industry is pretty behind. All right, so I guess the last question I have for you is, you know, unfortunately I feel like security has always been the top of mind, but often the bottom of budget yeah. uh, when it comes through. Uh, seeing a lot of startups in this space, um, you know, some of the other solutions that are helping to simplify the environments, take hyperconvergence for example, uh, I, I hear the people saying, I'm finally getting to do the security initiatives. And when people uh, look at cloud environments and security, as you said, they, they tackle the, go the governance first, but, you know, security comes up. So, you know, wh why is this an important time for the whole security? conversation? Well, it's, it's an important time because people are getting tired of their CEOs getting fired and their shareholders getting sued, right? I mean, uh, and, and the boards are now creating a 30-minute block in every board meeting to talk about risk, right? Because this is, this is now starting to impact people besides the security professionals. And the problem and uh, the opportunity that exists in the space and the problem that exists in the space all at the same time is that you have great security technologies that are being released out there. And the reason why that people are reticent, reticent from going to the cloud and security's number one issue, is they don't know what to do with it. Because the security technologies, I, I use this analogy, but it's, you know, I think about them as blacksmiths, right? All the security companies are nothing but blacksmiths. They provide swords and shields to organizations. And the organizations don't know how to fight with them. You know, no one's the knights. 
and that's our role, right? We are actually wield the weapons to go fight the battles. And so these security organ these, or these organizations are like, I want to leverage the cloud, and I look at the marketplace, and I look at all these swords and shields that are available in the marketplace, I don't know how to operationalize them. I don't have the threat intel team to add the intelligence within the framework to do you know, IP or UL blacklist, you know, blacklisting, and I don't have the operations team to manage the events that come out of it and to jump on bad, bad threats that, that fall from those events that I see. This is why you have people like Target that get breached. They spent tons of money. They had FireEye and all these kinds of incredible security technologies, but there was so much noise because they didn't have the intel to siphon down the noise into a, into a, uh, you know, a needle point to inspect, they didn't, have a they didn't have a security team to jump on the few events that they were able to see. And so, until we solve the blacksmiths versus the knights equation, people are still going to be scared to go into the cloud because they don't know what to do with the tools that are available to them. All right, well, Chris Drake, really appreciate you coming on this, uh, talk, talk to this uh, critical issue as we, we look at cloud and what's going on in networking. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, and thank you for watching. We'll be right back with some of our wrap-up here on day two here from theCUBE at VMworld 2015.